Hey there, Hang Up listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, as seen on EV. Did you know that most EV models can travel 200 miles on a fully charged battery, with some up to 500 miles when fully charged? You can charge them at home or at thousands of DC fast chargers nationwide. And how about this? EVs produce zero tailpipe emissions. Talk about living more sustainably. Head to SceneOnEV.com to learn more and stick around to hear from people who love their EVs. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card is a different kind of credit card. It gives you up to 3% unlimited cash back on everything you buy. It's real cash that never expires or loses value. And you can use it on anything. Grab a morning coffee, pick up a tab, or pay back a friend. Apply now on the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City Branch. Subject to credit approval. Daily cash is available via Apple Cash Card, issued by Green Dot Bank, member FDIC, or as a statement credit. Terms apply. Very early on Saturday morning, Memphis Grizzlies point guard Ja Morant went on Instagram Live and briefly brandished a gun. The 23-year-old Morant is maybe the most explosive athlete in a league populated by the world's most explosive athletes. He's also one of the NBA's most charismatic and marketable players. And now, as the NBA looks into that video and possibly some other incidents we'll get to in a minute, he's going to be off the court for what's been described as an indefinite period of time. In a statement, Morant said that he's going to take some time away to get help and work on learning better methods of dealing with stress and my overall well-being. Joining us now is Molly Hensley-Clancy. She's a national sports reporter for The Washington Post with a focus on investigations and accountability. You might recall we've had her on before to talk about her stories on abuse in the National Women's Soccer League. Molly, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. This Instagram Live Gun episode and the follow-up from it came just a couple days after you published an investigative piece about how, and I quote from the story, John Morant and people close to him have been accused of threatening and even violent behavior. Can you quickly run through those allegations? Yeah, so several of the allegations were kind of already out there. I think the the prominent ones that we knew of were the existence of this lawsuit from this teenager who alleged that John Morant punched him um, after a pickup basketball game um, and his friend um, also punched him. Um, And there's a police report about that that we knew about. Um, TMZ reported those. And then, you know, there was this incident um, involving the Pacers um, where someone had trained a laser from a car in which Morant was riding on the Pacers, members of the Pacers organization. The Athletic reported this. Uh, So we looked into kind of a collection of all of this. Um, We actually found another police report and significantly it came four days before the incident um, involving this teenage boy and the alleged assault there. And that police report, you know, had a security guard at the mall alleging that John Morant shows up to you know, defend his mom after a fight at a finish line Sioux store. And he threatens the security guard and the security guard, you know, feels threatened enough that he tells the police about this. Um, And then, you know, we also got uh, transcripts of police interviews in which it turns out that the teenager had told police he saw John Morant's gun um, after the fight, that John Morant had gone into his house, come back out with a gun in the waistband of his pants and kind of, uh, you know, not pulled it, but, you know, brandished it or or flashed it at the kid. That's the, the total of everything we knew up to the point of the Instagram Live video. And the other things that we know are that John Morant has been, as Josh said, one of the uh, youngest, best stars in the NBA, um, absolutely charismatic player, there are videos, you know, 20, 10 and 20 minute long videos on YouTube of him dunking in the NBA. He's an amazing player um, and projected as sort of the next, you know, in the next pantheon of, of, of great NBA players. We also know that there have been numerous incidents, not necessarily the kinds that have risen to you know, criminal complaints um, involving Morant or his family. His father got into that argument with Shannon Sharp. His father has been, you know, is courtside screaming at the other team. His friends have been doing that too. And now we know of at least three times allegations that guns were involved. The YouTube video, uh, the, sorry, the Instagram Live video, the incident at his house, and that laser pointer incident where 
a security guard for the Pacers believed that the laser was attached to a gun. You know, this is why I think, obviously, the NBA has sort of suspended him without suspending him officially and said he has stepped away. And the Grizzlies have said that he has stepped away and he is going to be getting help. Um, When you were reporting this story, did you see this accumulation of incidents or evidence about sort of who Morant is and who he is associated with? Has that been part of the narrative that you uncovered in reporting on these cases? Yeah, I think that's um, the reason we really decided to do this story, even though some of this had had already been out there, because we felt like, you know, even though this incident with the security guard is not necessarily, you know, it didn't rise to charges, you know, police didn't do anything about it. Um, it felt like it really established this, you know, pattern. It was four days apart from, you know, when he goes and, and hits this kid in, in the face uh, or in the head. Um, and we also, we did report that in the police file, um, the kid says that John Morant's best friend, um, who he doesn't name, also punched him multiple times, you know, came up on the other side of him. We reported that that friend is Devonte Pack, who's named in the kid's lawsuit and who also, you know, appeared in this, uh, you know, Pacers incident. He was banned from games for a year. John Morant said after it, he, he got up and got out on the court during the game um, and had to be escorted out. So like you said, it's there's this pattern of also the people around him, you know, his parents were present um, when this altercation happened with the teenage boy too. The other pattern that I kind of recognize here, and I think everyone would probably recognize, is that all of these incidents started with something pretty innocuous and something that you would hope that someone who had impulse control would be able to walk away from and deal with in a different way. You know, a dispute in a pickup basketball game. A with a teenager. A, with a teenager. A dispute um, at a store at a mall. A dispute around normal stuff that happens at an NBA game leads to this thing with a laser pointer that may or may not have been attached to a gun. And another thing, you know, I don't know if something comes to mind from your other reporting that you've done um, on other sports or anything else, Molly, is that this Instagram Live where he just kind of is holding a gun and shows a gun, in some ways it's really disturbing because of just how cavalier he was. But I think in other ways, it just shows the power of video. I mean, it's just one second of him not even doing anything, just holding a gun. If there was video of any of these other incidents, like if there was video, if we had video of him punching the teenager, I think John Moran's image would be very different than it is right now. And it's understandable that even a like long police report and these narratives that you got um, it's, it's powerful, but it's not powerful in the same way as, um, seeing something. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the video. And then I think it's also the choice to film that, um, on your own page days after, you know, these allegations have come out. It, it has this air of, I'm not taking this seriously. I mean, also the other thing that we haven't mentioned was the night that my story came out, he did like a celebration that kind of mimed pointing a gun, um, or something like that um, in a game. So there, there was a sense that he, you know, wasn't taking it seriously. Sam Amick also reported, and I didn't know about this, that Morant tweeted and deleted in May 2022, telling a fan it's free to see how hollows feel. I mean, this is a guy who, for a while, and this is, I think, is what you were saying before, Molly. This is the point of your reporting, has been saying and doing this sort of thing, and it's maybe gone kind of unnoticed or unremarked upon. Yeah, I think one thing in the course of my reporting that I was kind of surprised by was how little pickup this story involving this teenage boy had gotten. Um, there are definitely some reasons to, you know, be kind of aware or things to be aware of regarding it. You know, his mom, the teenage boy's mom does have a history of filing um, lawsuits that are kind of frivolous or could be called frivolous against various like the fire department and the school system. Um, so there's, you know, we did find that. Um, but one thing that the reason we kind of really latched onto these police interviews is because in them, you know, you hear John Morant describe it from 
what happened from his perspective. And it's really not that different from what the kid's saying. There's a disagreement over whether, you know, the kid intentionally threw the ball at him um, when he was checking it. But otherwise, you know, John Moran says, yeah, he threw a ball at me. I interpreted it as, you know, him wanting to fight me. He stepped towards me and pulled up his pants. And so I punched him and then my friend punched him and he fell to the ground, you know. So he's, he says the quote in the police interviews that stuck out to me was, I swung first, he said, but to me, the basketball was the first swing. Um, so he's interpreting a kid throwing a ball as, you know, someone punching him. That was not really super new information, but it kind of confirmed that, you know, he's not really disputing what happened um, besides like whether the ball was thrown intentionally or not. John Hollinger of The Athletic has a really terrific piece analysis of the situation. And uh, Hollinger was the Grizzlies vice president of basketball operations from 2012 to 2019. And he wrote over the weekend a couple of things that I think are important to remember here. One is that this is Morant's responsibility. And for all the talk about the people around Morant and his friends and his family members, at this point, it's up to him that to, to, to not do these kinds of things and not put himself in these kinds of situations. And the second point, which is sort of a little bit of a counter to that, is that John writes, it's easy to forget that few athletes have gone from zero to 60 quite like Morant has. He wasn't a highly recruited athlete coming out of high school. He came from a small town in South Carolina. And now suddenly he is being talked about as a future Hall of Famer. And Hollinger writes, maybe, just maybe, this is the incident that turns the light bulb on for Morant to button down. If not, he's going to force the organization that he put back on the map with some very hard decisions going forward. And there are some similarities here to the conversation we had about Alabama basketball last week, where the kind of first step for the program is to say, when something comes out, oh, yeah, we knew about that. You know, that's it's been addressed. Which is what the Grizzlies have done. It's important to say here, Josh, right? <laughs> that, that's what I'm saying, the parallels. And then there's also the similarity, Molly, with, the uh, you know, Brandon Miller does the TSA pat down. Um, before yep. the game that shows yep. a kind of cavalier attitude um, similarly. And then, you know, it, in this case with the Grizzlies, they there is this ambiguity about whether it's a suspension, but at least everyone's saying, whether it's Taylor Jenkins, the coach, or Morant himself, the organization now is at least saying the right things about this is really serious and not just that, like, he needs to step away and we're concerned about him. They've said that, but also that like guns are no joke and like this is not a good thing that he did as the kind of, I don't know why or how they did it, but like it seems like at least the Alabama athletic department has recognized that they need to stop like screwing around and needs to actually say that this is a bad and, and serious thing. But th there did seem to be, you know, some wagon circling in Memphis, Molly, around just the idea of like, why are you bringing up old stuff? Like, this has been addressed, this has been out there. Did you kind of hear that as you were doing your reporting? Yeah, I mean, the Grizzlies uh, did not, you know, give me a comment. Um, and to me, that was, was telling. I think the NBA, you know, did say this is, you know, we looked into this. Like, gr the Grizzlies didn't want to comment at all. Um, and, you know, go I think that this point about, like, this is a moment where he could make choices that, you know, are not that – move him in a different direction. I think that, you know, I feel like the the video, the Instagram live video, you know, people were hoping when my story came out that, you know, you could see people saying this is that moment, you know, like he can at this point, at that point, he hadn't faced any discipline. Um, you know, nothing was going on besides, you know, this past stuff is out there, but now he can kind of chart a different path. And then to have, you know, two days later, him appearing with a gun, I feel like that was kind of like, a, you know, people saying, OK, well, <laughs> you know, we thought you had your moment. And, you know, this this could be that moment, too. But it is a little bit of a, you know, missed opportunity um, at, at the point the story, you know, came out and some of this was out there. It's disappointing in some ways for it to get to the point that it has to be like a live display of a firearm on social media for public steps to be taken. You know, guns are kind of the third rail in the NBA. I mean, it's ever since the Gilbert Arenas and Javaris Crittenden brought guns into the locker room in 2010, um, it has been a no-go for the public display of guns. You know, you're not seeing a lot of NBA players come out and show support for John Morant here because I think there's an understanding that even though a lot of players do own guns, 
that this is a line that you can't cross. I think that's a little bit of what we're seeing here too, Josh. John Morant now is being treated as someone with a problem that needs treatment or he's going to jeopardize his career as opposed to someone to just say, hey, we're handling it in-house and it's going to be okay. I think the conversation around this, at least that I've seen, has been pretty good since Saturday, that Jalen Rose had a really strong, like, three-minute yeah. um, speech that people can look up. I thought Bamani Jones made some really good points, that the kind of expressions of concern for him, I think, are appropriate, while also I haven't seen much kind of excuse-making around what he's done and his behavior, because this is... I mean, I apologize for the cliche, but it is kind of a cry for help to act in the way that he did. Like you said, Molly, after this stuff had come out there, it is concerning. And, um, you know, I'm concerned for the people that have been menaced by his alleged behavior for the teenager that got punched. I'm concerned for them, too. But like he's some John Morant is somebody who not only has such great not potential, he's a great athlete right now, but he has a particular both position and I think a responsibility as being the athlete in the city of Memphis, which has had tremendous problems with gun violence, but also is a city, and this might not feel as important, but it's a city that doesn't really have other major sports teams. So he's kind of like a Damian Lillard in Portland with apologies to the Timbers and the Thorns, but he is somebody who is so important to that city and to the people who live in that city and who takes such pride in his accomplishments and who like love the Grizzlies and the kind of, you know, persona that that they have. And so it's a big burden on somebody to feel like they're kind of the person in the whole city is is looking up to. But it's it's been the reality for him. It's going to continue to be the reality for him. And there's not really any escaping it. And so, you know, I, I guess, Molly, how, how have you felt about the conversation that's happened since, you know, both your piece and since, um, you know, the Instagram Live on, on Saturday and kind of where, where do you hope it goes in the coming days? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I thought a lot about the, you know, who he is to this city. It, it start, I mean, it started in just reading the the police interview transcripts because, you hear this teenage boy talk about him. He really, you know, idolized him. And this teenage boy is like a basketball, a young basketball star. He's a young basketball player. He's, you know, he, he saw John Moran as kind of a mentor, but, you know, even right before he's talking about, you know, his hero, uh, you know, striking, punching him, he's talking about, oh my God, he was doing these amazing things with the ball. Like I was just, I was amazed to watch him play. I was so, he was like honored to be there. Um, so I think like there's that, you know, you're reminded of that, of who he means to, to these people and also like what it means to have then your hero, you know, hit you, <laughs> um, and knock you down and, and, you know, leave marks and, and all that kind of stuff. So it was like, it was kind of sad and jarring to think about that. I I agree with you that I feel like it's been pretty measured and balanced and that there's, you know, I think that one, that one interesting dynamic is when you think about the people around him, like I do think it's become very clear that, you know, probably they're not, maybe not having those conversations with him. So like you do see people kind of taking on this role of like, okay, I'm going to come at this from outside and say like, I've been there, you know, this is what you have to do because, you know, that is such a pattern in these stories over and over again is like the people close to him are, are not, you know, holding him back, not saying like, you know, it's his mom calling him, say, come to the finish line. Like I'm having a fight with a store employee, according to the police report. So I think it's been, I think it's been pretty good conversation. And I do think I was surprised. There wasn't a ton of, uh, you know, pickup in sports media necessarily. Like there was a lot of conversation um, about my story about the the gun, the police report, some of it on TV, but we didn't see some of like other outlets pick it up. And I feel like the moment that video came out, everyone was like, okay, now we can, we can all cover this, you know, which is interesting. I I don't know quite what to make of it. Yeah. I mean, and Stefan, this like suspension that isn't a suspension, it just really buys everyone time. It buys Morant a little time, the team and the league, and the decision is going to have to be made at some point what the official league posture is on this, the team um, posture, what Morant is going to say or do next. And so that I think is the next moment when 
you know, the conversation will shift and there'll be yeah. a discussion about, is this too much? Is this too little? What's appropriate? Who's the, should we be empathizing with him or should we be punishing him or a combination of both? And so that we're not at that, at that moment, that inflection point yet. And it's important also to note that the Grizzlies have been really good. They're the number two seed in the Western Conference. There's a lot riding just from the pure basketball um, perspective on John Morant's return to this team as quickly as possible as we head toward the playoffs. Um, and that also will be telling how both the Grizzlies and the NBA choose to treat this and choose to punish him or support him or get him whatever help he needs combined with when and how he will be allowed to return to the court. Molly Hensley Clancy is a national sports reporter for The Washington Post. We'll link to her reporting on John Morant in our show page. Molly, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Up next, ESPN's Don Van Natta Jr. on whether it's finally, finally time for Dan Snyder to be gone from the NFL. No matter how the last game went, anytime you take the field, you got a shot at greatness. Give your team the best shot at winning by recruiting more MVPs with Indeed. Indeed is the only job site where you're guaranteed to find quality applications to meet your must-have requirements or else you don't pay. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites hoping to find candidates with the right skills, you need one powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. Indeed partners with you on every step of the hiring process. Find great talent through time-saving tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. With Instant Match, as soon as you sponsor a post, you get a short list of quality candidates with resumes on Indeed that match your job description, and you can invite them to apply right away. Plus, you only pay for quality applications that meet your must-have requirements. Start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash hangup. Offer valid through March 31st. Go to Indeed.com slash hangup to claim your $75 credit before March 31st. Indeed.com slash hangup. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. In 1999, the National Football League approved an $800 million bid by a group led by a young marketing executive named Daniel Snyder to acquire the team in Washington. Then Commissioner Paul Tagliabue called Snyder the perfect person to continue the legacy of the three-time Super Bowl winning franchise. Snyder told the team's fans, you want to win, we want to win, and we're going to deliver that. In the years since, Snyder has not delivered another championship or come close to one, but he has alienated fans, players, coaches, fellow NFL owners, and government officials in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia and spawned league, congressional, and now criminal investigations into the team's business and workplace operations and his personal behavior. In an ESPN investigation published last week, Don Van Natta Jr. uncovered documents alleging that Snyder obtained a secret and possibly illegal $55 million loan and used the team as his personal piggy bank, spending millions to staff his yachts and homes and to slap the team's former logo on the side of his personal jet. Don Van Natta is here now. Welcome back to the show, Don. Thank you. Great to be with you guys. All right, your story came during a busy week in the Snyder saga. Snyder also reportedly demanded that the NFL legally indemnify him if he sells the team, for which he is considering bids, though not apparently from Jeff Bezos, because Snyder hates the Washington Post, which Bezos owns. Snyder's fellow owners were so pissed off by the indemnification demand that they're considering a vote to force him out as owner. Don, do you think this is the end game for Dan Snyder? Oh, absolutely. He's in the final furlong uh, of the race. A vast majority of the NFL owners have lost patience with Dan Snyder. It's a complicated bunch of reasons why that's happened. A big part of it is because he's costing them money. And when you do that, no matter what all the other allegations are, you get in trouble. Uh, Snyder can't get a new stadium in either Virginia, Maryland, or D.C. That's a problem. But the way he has talked about the owners, as we reported last October, 
uh, telling fellow owners that he's gathered dirt on them, as well as on Commissioner Roger Goodell, that the NFL is a mafia. And now this latest uh, problem that he's created, and it's an embarrassing one for the NFL, that he is being looked into the finances of the commanders by prosecutors in Virginia. All of that, I think, has reached critical mass. And so if he doesn't sell willingly, which is what it, the NFL owners prefer to happen, then I think they might press the nuclear button here and force him out. They don't want to do that because it's an unprecedented action. And any uh, NFL owner worries that at some point the turret gun of badness could be pointed at them and force them out in the same way. But if they have to do it, they will do it. Because as I say, most important of all, Dan Snyder is costing them money. So there's a bunch of stuff in your new story, Don. Um, the $55 million loan the obtained seems, as Stefan said in his uh, intro, possibly illegal. It's also kind of confusing to <laughs> explain what exactly went on here. And so for that, I also appreciated the detail of him paying himself four and a half million dollars to advertise the team on his own private plane, which is the kind of detail that I think we look for as reporters, where it's just like so obviously self-dealing and wrong and brazen and maybe helps the medicine go down a little bit. Um, but can you kind of ex explain the loan and what went on there? And I'll just note to the listeners that you are vigorously nodding at my characterization of the four and a half million dollar uh, plain advertisement as being an amazing detail you look for as a journalist. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It jumped off the page. When, when I obtained the 61 page uh, NFL arbitration document that was a petition filed in the summer of 2020 by Dan Snyder's three billionaire limited partners, his ex-partners now, who put together this whole laundry list of complaints of financial misconduct by Dan Snyder, the four and a half million dollars uh, that Snyder allegedly paid himself for having a tiny team logo on the tail of one of his personal jets and calling it an advertising fee. Yeah, that's that's gold for a journalist. That's something that everybody can understand. Then he, then he asked them to pay him four and a half million dollars to take the logo off. No, I'm kidding about that. I'm kidding about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that's that's just so ridiculous and absurd on its face. But the central part of the petition and and the part of it that it's actually sees the attention of prosecutors in the Eastern District of Virginia, as well as FBI agents and IRS agents, is this $55 million credit line that Snyder secretly obtained from Bank of America in December of 2018. And I say secretly because he did it without the knowledge or the required permission of his three fellow partners. Now, these guys who are partners are billionaires. Fred Smith is the co-founder of FedEx, Robert Rothman and Dwight Sharp. These three guys are billionaires. Fred Smith is the co-founder of FedEx. Robert Rothman and Dwight Shar are also very serious investors who owned a total of 40% of the team. And they found out about this credit line 16 months after Snyder took it out in a footnote in a financial audit in April of 2020. And Josh, it just so happens that that same month was the month that Snyder failed to pay these three guys a quarterly profit sharing payment. So they're then very quickly on notice of what is really going on here with the finances. And when they do their digging, they find out, as they put it, that Snyder was using the team as his personal piggy bank. But the reason why the loan is so important is in order to get a loan, and anybody who's taken out a mortgage knows this, you need all sorts of documents for the bank to give you one. One of the required documents was a board resolution, basically showing that the board of directors of the team, including these three partners, approved this new debt. That never happened. And so that's where you get into questions of bank fraud. And, you know, we have a whole bunch of documents that I highlighted in the story where you have lawyers for the bank asking executives of the commanders, where is the board resolution? They claim there is one, but then there's never one that's been found. And so that is really where it could get very serious for Dan Snyder and for the team. And that's, as I say, what the prosecutors and the agents are focusing on in Virginia. The National Football League doesn't look good in any of this. I mean, Roger Goodell effectively 
approved that loan. Roger Goodell and the league approved extending Dan Snyder's debt limit by $450 million so that he could buy out those minority partners. Um, there's nobody is covering themselves in glory here. And you can make an argument that for the last almost quarter century, the NFL has done nothing but enabled Dan Snyder as he has run roughshod over the workplace environment, um, uh, there are claims of sexual harassment personally against him, um, reports in the Washington Post from a few years ago about how he had the team's cheerleaders pose and video circulated of them in various states of undress. The league could have taken action before, and now it's coming to bite them on the ass a little bit. Yeah, the league had an opportunity to investigate the circumstances surrounding this secret $55 million credit line. In fact, they were asked by the three limited partners of Snyder to go to Bank of America with a summons and find out what documentation, if any, had been provided. They made this request on December 30th, 2020. And just four days later, the NFL arbitrator and Jeff Pash, who's the NFL general counsel, both shut down the arbitration and moved it to mediation the following week, headed up by Roger Goodell. This is a bad look for the league because, as you said, Stefan, Roger Goodell approved this loan personally. I have a document with his signature on it. He basically underwrote the loan. And the question is whether there was any due diligence done by the league. And it appears that there wasn't much. And so... The fact that the league had zero interest in investigating the circumstances surrounding this at the same time, by the way, that Beth Wilkinson, the Washington, D.C. attorney, is investigating Snyder for a toxic workplace culture, as well as sexual misconduct by Snyder himself. And we all know what happened to that investigation. There was no physical report. Beth Wilkinson gave her findings uh, verbally to the league and you could argue that Snyder got a slap on the wrist for the findings from the Wilkinson investigation. At the very same time Wilkinson is doing her investigation, the NFL is looking the other way on this alleged bank fraud. So it is, it, to your point, it's a very good one. The NFL is now dealing with a problem that they had plenty of opportunities to clean up years ago and did nothing about it. Well, we have ample evidence from this case and others that the NFL is not going to act um against an owner or probably any sports league won't act against an owner unless that owner is costing them money. Like anything that you can kind of do in your workplace place, even up to illegal things doesn't seem to have really crossed that red line for the NFL. Um, but a couple of things that I've found notable here, um, and I'm curious for your thoughts, Don, number one, these reports that just out of personal animus, Snyder is, doesn't want Bezos to bid for the team. Um, having an owner that they that they want out kind of set the terms and say, we don't want the richest guy in the world to be an owner, that seems like it would be a red line to me. Like that you're not going to allow the, <laughs> the guy who has infinite cash supply to come into the league because Dan Snyder doesn't want him to because he feels sad about the post coverage or annoyed, like get this guy out of the league I, it, is that's number one. Number two, I haven't seen much reference to this, but, and I f forgive me for this like complicated, like chain here, but didn't Bruce Allen say under oath that the NFL, like Lisa Friel, the NFL lawyer had told him that the commanders leaked the John Gruden emails. And so is there fear among NFL owners that the commanders or Snyder or people close to them, if they act, it's not only going to be that he sues, it's that he like allegedly <laughs> will unleash just like whatever like payload or ammunition he has against the entire league? Well, yes, I think that that's a reasonable conclusion to draw. Uh, not only uh, based on what Bruce Allen said that Lisa Friel told him about the Gruden email leaks, but, you know, more broadly, as we reported last October, Snyder has been running around for years telling people, including owners, by the way, that he has gathered dirt, uh, not just on fellow owners, but on Commissioner Roger Goodell. Amazing people skills on this guy. 
Yeah, right. Exactly. He has enough dirt, he says, Josh, to blow up the league. And I know from talking to people after that story dropped, it was news to some owners and it was news to some executives. And they were they were furious about it. This is not the way a partner should be speaking about another partner. And it wasn't a coincidence, just in a matter of days that Jim Ursay came out at that owners meeting in New York in October and said he thinks that there might be enough here to take a vote on Snyder's viability as an owner. Now, that can got kicked down the road somewhat on November 2nd when Snyder announced that he was going to hire Bank of America to look for uh, a buyer for the team. But on Jeff Bezos, this is another way in which Snyder is aggravating the owners right now. It's in all the NFL owners' interests to have the highest valuation possible and the greatest amount paid for the Washington Commanders. If Jeff Bezos is allowed to bid, he's got the largest checkbook. He has the means to write a check for a stadium, which the franchise so desperately needs. So the fact that Snyder is locking him out, if this is true, is another way in which the owners are like, wait a minute, you're costing us money. If you're going to sell to somebody for half a billion dollars less than you can sell for Jeff Bezos, that valuation impacts all of our valuations. So again, as I said at the top, the fact that Snyder is costing his fellow owners money, whether in the past with this allegation of two sets of books, which is more nickel and dime compared to the valuation question, or in the future of what Jerry Jones's franchise is going to be worth based on how much the commanders sell for, all of this is very, very concerning and why I would not rule out the nuclear button option, as I put it, that unprecedented vote to force Snyder to sell the team. You just mentioned Jerry Jones, the owner of the Cowboys, and there are reports that Jones is trying to broker a deal with Snyder. Snyder has been, uh, Jones has been one of the few people that has sort of had a good relationship with Snyder. They have vacationed on their yachts in the Mediterranean. They've spent a lot of time together. Um, and the broker deal would be that sell the team and go away quietly, drop these demands uh, for indemnification, drop these threats to sue your fellow or former fellow partners, if that were to happen. Then this connects to the Bezos piece because whoever buys this team, Don, this is going to be like buying a shack on a nice piece of land. And I think I'm going to make an analogy that you can relate to. I did a story about South Florida after Hurricane Andrew in the early 1990s and the opportunity to correct all the structural ills from decades of sprawl and mismanagement. This feels kind of the same to me. The Washington football team after Dan Snyder is South Florida after Hurricane Andrew. Um, the crazy thing is that the brand and the legacy, those remain, and they remain an opportunity for whoever buys this team. But whatever they pay, whether it's $5.6 billion, which is uh, one of the estimates, or $6 billion or more, the new owner is going to have to factor in at least a billion or two more on top of that to repair like almost a quarter century of neglect. Um, you might need a new stadium. I mean, they do need a new stadium, a new training facility, a poll uh, conducted by the Players Association Players rated the Washington Commanders' facilities the worst in the league, in addition to the way they treat family and their food services. They might even need a new name. This could be a total teardown. Yeah, it's absolutely a total teardown. And I, I love your parallel drawn uh, to post-Hurricane Andrew. It is that bad. Another analogy that I've drawn is that the Washington Commanders are sort of like a house that you see falling down that Snyder's offering to sell to you, but you can't do an inspection. Because what we've heard is he's not allowing any of these bidders to look completely at the books. That's a problem, particularly if you read my story from last week at what a mess the finances are of the team. We've heard that Snyder uh, and the team are up to a billion dollars in debt to Bank of America. That's got to come off the top like a mortgage uh, if and when he finally sells it. So, yeah, there. From from my perspective, the lack of the stadium is the biggest issue. And um, whoever buys it, if it's not somebody who can write a check for it, the way Stan Kroenke uh, dug out his checkbook and wrote a, wrote a check for SoFi Stadium, then you're going to have whoever buys it's going to have to lobby either Maryland, Virginia, or D.C. You're going to need a stalking horse to get public money. There's going to be reluctance, I think, to put up the public money. It complicates matters. And... Um, to your point about Jerry Jones, yes, there needs to be a sort of brokered settlement here 
Jerry Jones has always seen Dan Snyder as a protege. I saw it when I did a profile of Jerry Jones back in 2014. Snyder was constantly calling Jerry on Jerry's old flip phone, uh, trying to ingratiate himself with Jerry. Uh, Jerry loved it because this was a younger guy who he saw in his own image seeking advice. And it really will take Jerry Jones, I think, to broker a piece here. And we'll see if it happens. But if there is no peace, and there may not be, because as we all know, Snyder is one of the most stubborn people in American sports, if not the most stubborn. Uh, he may not go quietly. And if he doesn't, it will force the owners and Commissioner Goodell, all of whom have run out of patience with him, to take him out themselves. Dom Van Natta is an investigative reporter for ESPN. We'll post a link to his recent reporting about Dan Snyder on our show page. Don, thank you so much for coming on the show with us. Thank you, guys. Up next, we'll talk about tiny Bryce Young and the NFL Draft with our friend Alex Kirshner. Time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card is a different kind of credit card. It gives you up to 3% unlimited cash back on everything you buy. It's real cash that never expires or loses value. And you can use it on anything. Grab a morning coffee, pick up a tab, or pay back a friend. Apply now on the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City Branch. Subject to credit approval. Daily cash is available via Apple Cash Card, issued by Green Dot Bank, member FDIC, or as a statement credit. Terms apply. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you're going to be doing right now, getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you can save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the more than 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Alabama quarterback Bryce Young, winner of the Heisman Trophy and considered by many to be the number one prospect in the NFL draft, measured in at 5 foot 10 and 1 8 inches and 204 pounds at the Combine in Indianapolis, making it official that he'll be one of the teen tiniest quarterbacks ever selected. Meanwhile, Florida's Anthony Richardson measured in at 6 foot 4, 244 pounds, ran a disgustingly fast 4.43 in the 40-yard dash, and set quarterback records at the Combine with a 40-and-a-half-inch vertical leap and a 10-foot, 9-inch broad jump. Joining us now is Alex Kirshner, who's a contributing writer at Slate, one of the hosts of the college football podcast Split Zone Duo. Alex, I bet you're doing laps around both of those guys in blogs per minute. Yeah, I don't know that Bryce Young's ever written a blog in his career. (laughs) That could come back to haunt him, Uh, and maybe it won't. You know, these are kind of just speculative things that we need to talk about at the start of these players' careers. The numbers I just read out for Anthony Richardson are going to convince some team to bet its future on him, despite these other numbers I'm about to read. 24 career touchdown passes and 15 interceptions. Um, Compare that to Bryce Young's 79 touchdown passes and 12 interceptions. Um, So which guy would you rather have? Maybe the enormous dude who can run a 4-4. I don't know. (laughs) I would rather have Bryce Young, personally. And it's not close. Uh, of course, you you issue a take like that, a proclamation in March of a player's draft year, and you are at high risk of getting egg on your face for years and years and years down the line. I have been humbled, as I think a lot of people were humbled, 
by Josh Allen, for instance, making the transition from being a thoroughly average quarterback in the Mountain West Conference at Wyoming to being a cyborg who is in the top tier of non-Patrick Mahomes quarterbacks in the entire world and who could be a Hall of Famer one day, could certainly win a Super Bowl. We don't know everything. There has now been a provable exception to the rule that if you are not good in college, you will not be good in the NFL. That has been historically pretty ironclad. You saw Josh Allen break it, though. You've seen Daniel Jones, who was okay in college, to be fair. He wasn't terrible at Duke, start to puncture that a little bit more uh, over the last year with the New York Giants, and some team's about to give him a big bag of money. So I'm not saying that Anthony Richardson can't make it or won't be good. He might he might very well, and some team is going to pick him high. But Bryce Young is uh, what we in the industry call that dude. He's really short, but I'm a believer. I just think he has the juice, the stuff. The talents, uh, not the height, but I think he's going to be one of the rare short king and effective NFL quarterbacks. As he said, I've been this size respectfully my whole life, which must have been really interesting when he was like five. He must have fucking tore it up. Yeah. In, in <laughs> yeah. Warner. Came, came out of the womb at 5'10 and 204. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why is this a, even a topic of conversation anymore? I mean, the last decade has seen the NFL transition in some regards to quarterbacks who are smaller and mobile. Um, is this a function of the combine doing what the combine does, which is measure hand size and standing broad jump, which was, by the way, my favorite gym activity in elementary school? Or, you know, is it is there really still something to, oh, my God, he's only 5'10 or 5'11"? Um, and is therefore fragile and not and, and prone to injury and a bigger risk than a uh, conventionally sized six foot four quarterback. There is something to it. And as much as I like to deride NFL personnel, insanity and draft culture and all of that, there is something to it. Like the numbers are not big of no pun intended of quarterbacks who have made it work at a really high level, at a level worthy of being one of the first few picks in the draft in recent times in the NFL. There aren't none, and, and there are some very good ones. Uh, Drew Brees was small. Uh, I don't know. He was probably not more than six feet, and I don't know what his real measurement was. Russell Wilson, not a tall man. Uh, Kyler Murray has shown signs, though that's not really trending in a good direction uh, for a first overall pick right now with the Arizona Cardinals. Baker Mayfield not really going in a good direction either. So you see the point. You have to, you have to kind of pick your spots. You have to be selective if you are looking to make the case for a small quarterback, I just think Bryce Young's really, really good. And I think sometimes you need to not outsmart yourself when you are in this business. But I do get it. I understand why a team would look at Anthony Richardson on the flip side of this uh, and see the sun, the moon, and the stars and think that you can mold an athlete of this caliber into a quarterback of a commensurate cal caliber. Uh, because he wasn't that at Florida. He was not great. You know, he was a perfectly serviceable SEC quarterback, and he made some plays. He had a highlight reel that is up there with anybody's. Uh, but it sort of comes down to what, what you value more. Do you value what you could dream up based on certain measurables, or do you value what you could dream up based on what you have seen between the lines on Saturdays for two, three, four years. Uh, and in that area, Bryce has a decided advantage on, I think, anybody else. I mean, when I had my purple and gold glasses on during the LSU Florida games where Anthony Richardson played, I was definitely very happy when he dropped back to throw. As long as he didn't run. <laughs> like, when the ball like left his hand, that was like a positive play for the defense generally compared to, for instance, Bryce Young, where you were just in, in fear every time that, you know, ball went down the field out of his hand. And the contrast that's so fascinating here, Alex, is that let's say you're a team at or near the top of the draft. If you take Bryce Young, you're betting on his numbers, the qualities that he had, the kind of high level Winning that he had, probably the fact that he was coached by Nick Saban in an NFL-like environment. But you are going to have to account in your offense and your scheme for the fact that he's short and likes to run around. Like, you're not going to be able to just, like, drop him in as, like, Alabama quarterback who threw for 79 touchdowns and won the Heisman Trophy and, like, have him go in the NFL and, and just, like, not address what his strengths and weaknesses are. Whereas with Anthony Richardson, he's a guy who 
is seemingly like designed in a lab where you wouldn't need to do anything particularly sneaky or tricky around him to give yourself just an enormous athletic advantage. And yet he has not shown the ability to play quarterback in an extremely high level. So there would have to be some element of hubris there, right? That our program and our system is such that we can transform this guy, but you're t- you're taking the like raw materials or ingredients that any team or player would kill to have. There are a lot of 6'5", 230 quarterbacks in the history of the NFL draft in the first and second round. Um, you know, the belief is that you can change an athlete, and athletes do change. I mean, look at Brock Purdy. He is a legit NFL quarterback because of what he did in the in the year since he was drafted and how he was trained and retrained. I mean, so it's there, but isn't it all speculative on some level? To put a tiny bit of yoke on Alex's face, in the piece where he did a mea culpa for um, Josh Allen, there was a tiny swipe at Daniel Jones (laughs) at the end of the piece before (laughs) Daniel Jones had started to improve a bit. So we don't even, you know, we can have egg on our face years into a a player's career. You can, and... It, at some point, the projectability, the the looks, the partness, if you will, of a quarterback does run out. You know, like there are innumerable tall, broad shouldered. Uh, by the way, this is oftentimes a euphemism for white. I think in the history of the NFL draft, like you, you don't hear you hear the prototype looks the part. There's a certain look, uh, and I think that has historically included mostly white quarterbacks who are who are attributed to have that look. Um, but you know, Jacob Eason is a backup quarterback in the NFL. Paxton Lynch, Brock Osweiler, washed out of the NFL. Uh, there are counterexamples. You know, Justin Herbert and Trevor Lawrence played each other in a, in a playoff game a couple of months ago, and these two absolutely look like the designed in the lab quarterback. Uh, and you can find, you know, a, enough examples of, of short quarterbacks who washed out short quarterbacks who were, who were really good, where I think if you are an NFL general manager or an NFL head coach or a quarterbacks coach or an offensive coordinator, you have more than enough ammunition, no matter what the archetype is of quarterback that you're looking for, whether you're looking for college results or combine results or tall or short. I mean, obviously you would rather have tall in a vacuum, you can convince yourself that you can fix them, that you can make this player be what every NFL franchise craves, uh, which is the franchise, which is everything. And some team is going to do that with Anthony Richardson. I don't think they're going to do it before Bryce Young because I just think Bryce Young's qualities that he that he showed in spades at Alabama are enough to outweigh how small he is. But it's as I say, it's not nothing, and it's not like a team – with the right creative thinking is not going to be able to come up with a reason to pick Anthony Richardson, uh, or for that matter, to pick someone like Will Levis from Kentucky, who maybe is a toned down version of what we're talking about with Richardson. Not great college results, but but better than Richardson's and also a really strong arm. Um, and you'll also hear some talk about CJ Stroud from Ohio State, who is maybe somewhere in the middle of all of this. He had really, really impressive college results, not quite on Bryce Young's level, but really, really, really good and also is bigger and and has more of the looks the part to him. The team that's going to have to make a decision first is the Chicago Bears, who have the number one pick in the draft. The question for them is whether to take Bryce Young at all. There are other excellent football players (laughs) rated, uh, projected even higher than Bryce Young. Jalen Carter, the defensive tackle from Georgia. Will Anderson Jr., the edge from Alabama. Um, You wrote about this for Slate, Alex, um, what should the Chicago Bears do? They have a young, mobile quarterback who's getting better. Do they sort of punt on that and take Bryce Young? Or do they risk the ignominy of passing on Bryce Young and watching him become a great NFL quarterback? Well, you're risking ignominy either way, because either you are risking passing on Peyton Manning, if that's what Bryce Young is, uh, or if you trade Justin Fields, you're risking trading Brett Favre before all of the welfare stuff in the state of Mississippi and everything else that Brett Favre has done since he was an actually great NFL quarterback. Remember, the Atlanta Falcons traded this guy a year into his career before even before he was Brett Favre. Um, this is the cost of doing business is that you're going to risk looking terrible down the line. Uh, that's just that's the, the field these guys have all chosen. But I think that weighing everything, I would hang on to Justin Fields uh, and trade the pick or make a non-quarterback pick. But I would probably aim to trade the pick. Uh, 
because the Bears have a lot, a lot of problems. I think that is what they're going to do. That's what their general manager, Ryan Poles, has been telegraphing that they would like to do. Uh, and you can ideally use the pick to get another really high pick or two in exchange for only going back a few spots. And you can give Justin Fields a bit more help than he's had. Because I do think that there's a future for Justin Fields. He's a similar prospect two years ago to what Bryce Young is now before he had two really rough years in Chicago. If you drafted Bryce Young and traded out Justin Fields, what is the case that Bryce Young is going to have a more enjoyable first two years than Justin Fields has had? It's thin. It's flimsy. And so I think that if you're if you're just talking about cold, hard asset maximization, it makes the most sense to stick with, with Justin Fields and use the pick to fill in some things around him. You mentioned um, a couple minutes ago, Alex, that the prototype, you know, when you talk about looking the part and all that has traditionally been a six foot five white guy. It's interesting to me, notable, that all the quarterbacks that we've mentioned so far, Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, Anthony Richardson, Justin Fields, the only one who's white is Will Levis, who you kind of mentioned briefly in passing. And also, I find it very funny. Anthony Richardson refers to himself as Cam Jackson because he's part Cam Newton and part Lamar Jackson, two mm -hmm. other black quarterbacks. You also mentioned Kyler Murray. And so I think there is progress there that we can now talk about instead of, you know, a quarterback like whether it's Bryce Young or, or Anthony Richardson, you know, maybe 20 years ago. Or, or three years ago, we would have been talking about different positions. We would have been talking about guys going undrafted, you know, like Charlie Ward did out of Florida State. And so, um, you know, some biases in the NFL around, you know, size maybe around, you know, all sorts of things persist. But it does seem like the bias against black quarterbacks has effectively gone away. I would say that it has manifested differently. I think you still see things with certain black quarterbacks, and Justin Fields was a good example of this, where you would see questions raised about his processing ability, about how he could read defenses that when people looked into the game film from his time at Ohio State, just didn't see, just didn't see it showing up. And, and I, I don't want to be naive, uh, that they, that there are not going to be evaluators who come up with things about Anthony Richardson or about Bryce Young or about CJ Shroud or any other black quarterback um, that sound a lot like what some dumbass NFL general manager would have said in 1988 um, when they were telling some in incredibly talented black quarterback that they should go and play receiver or tight end or safety or whatever. I don't think we're ever going to completely distinguish that. Um, but it's, I think it is pretty clear that if you, if you want to be a successful NFL coach or general manager, you need to be acing the quarterback position or getting pretty close to acing the quarterback position. And if you are closing yourself off to a huge chunk of the talent pool at that position, um, as NFL teams used to do, um, then you are not, you are not brewing up a recipe for success. Uh, and you know, the Super Bowl being Patrick Mahomes versus Jalen Hurts was just one minor illustration, major illustration of the way that that has changed. Offenses have changed. You cannot have any more, certainly in 90% of college jobs and, and in probably 40, 50% of, of NFL jobs, you cannot just have a complete statue playing quarterback. You need to be recruiting a wide range of different people with different skin colors and different backgrounds who can actually move the ball with their legs, um, who can push the ball downfield with their arms. Uh, and if you're only looking at white guys to play quarterback, you are obviously closing yourself off to a huge, huge, huge group of people who could be really good quarterbacks. And so I think it goes all the way down the developmental chain, if you will, of football. You know, this starts with high school coaches having a black player who maybe years ago would have been forced to play receiver, play running back, play some other position. Now, when that kid's eight or nine years old, hey, try quarterback, see how you do. And you start to see that show up more and more downstream, not just in college, but also in the NFL draft. Alf Kirshner is a contributing writer at Slate. He hosts the college football podcast Split Zone Duo, and he's going to stick around. We're going to talk to him about whether the combine should even exist in our bonus segment. Alex, thanks for doing it. Of course.
This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and As Seen on EV. Electric vehicles offer so much more than a way to get you from point A to point B. Just ask any real EV owner. The EV that I drive, I love the dependability and range. The rebate, I got $7,500 back. Since driving an EV, I've found that I have really look forward to any reason for getting in my car. A lot of friends have driven my car and loved how it drives. I think when you get into one and drive it, the ease and the fun, it speaks for itself, honestly. I care about sustainability a lot, and it gives me peace of mind knowing that uh, driving a car with zero tailpipe emissions means that I'm doing my own small part. What I love about owning an EV is never having to go to a gas station. It's smooth and quiet. I can charge my EV while continuing to live my life. I actually feel good and happy when I get into my EV. From SUVs to hatchbacks to trucks, there is an EV that's right for just about any lifestyle. Electric vehicles are worth watching. So head to SceneOnEV.com to learn more. That's SceneOnEV.com. And now it is time for After Balls, sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice, endorsed by Kenny Sailors, who says it's okay. Bryce Young is just the latest in an appropriately short line of itty-bitty NFL quarterbacks. Itty-bitty defined as under six feet. There haven't been that many. In addition to Tyler Murray and Russell Wilson, the five foot eleven club notables include Seneca Wallace, Pat Hayden from the 1970s, the Washington great Sonny Jurgensen, Doug Flutie heads up the five tenors. Below that, the names grow more obscure. Five nine QBs include the likes of John Gallegos, who played one season for the Oakland Raiders in the AFL in 1962. A bunch of guys from the 1930s and 40s, Young Bussy, Chuck Fennenbach, and the great Eddie LeBaron, who after fighting in Korea, played 12 seasons for Washington and Dallas from 1952 to 63 and remains the shortest quarterback ever selected to the Pro Bowl, a distinction that likely will never be equaled. Then there are the really short dudes. The greatest of them was five foot seven Davy O'Brien, who won the Heisman Trophy at TCU in 1938 when the Frogs were national champions. I really wish Joel were here right now. O'Brien was the fourth pick of the 1939 NFL draft by the Eagles, broke fellow TCU alum Sammy Baugh's single season passing record, and was an all pro in 1939 and 1940. But O'Brien retired after his second season to become an FBI agent. The College Football Award for Best Quarterback, the O'Brien Award, is named for him. But I'm going to name this week's after ball. Josh, for another diminutive quarterback, 5'7", 165-pound Reno Nori. The Flyin' Finn earned 17 letters in five sports at Northern Illinois University in the 1930s. Football, basketball, baseball, track, and wrestling. His NFL career, alas, was short. He played in six games at quarterback for the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1937, completing 11 of 23 passes with one touchdown and three interceptions and running 26 times for 81 yards. And also one game as a halfback for George Hallis and the Chicago Bears in 1938. In that game, he was blocking when a Lions player crashed into the back of his knee, tearing ligaments. Nori told a newspaper reporter in 1983 after Hallis died that Hallis told him after his injury, the only way that thing is going to heal is to go out and run on it. Nori tried to run on it. Didn't last very long. He retired. Went on to coach high school football. Josh, what's your Reno Nori? I thought you were going to say he lettered in football, basketball, baseball, and thoroughbred horse racing. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been the most impressive combination. So not all podcasts are sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice. We're one of the few, uh, the lucky. Um, we definitely support having advertisers. Advertisers come at us. We in enjoy uh, giving you ads on the show so we can uh, support ourselves. And if you do listen to podcasts like this and other ones, you may have heard an ad just like this one, read in this case by... ESPN Zach Lowe of my uh, fave, the Low Post podcast. So you'll hear Zach's voice and then you'll hear another voice. 
Let's listen. Make every moment more this season with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. 21 plus in select states. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non withdrawable free bets that expire 14 days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Virginia. 1 800 Next Step or text Next Step to 53342 in Arizona. 1 888 789 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut. We're going to just take a brief pause, Stefan. There's a lot more states left to go. We just need to catch our breath. And that's like not on double speed. That's in real speed on the uh, low post podcast. All right. Let's hear some more. Each one has dramatic details, terrific trims, stupendous styling, precision paint jobs, working wheels, micro machine cars, the best variety, including Lamborghini, Trans Am, Corvette, Volvo, Ford, Blazer, Pickup Charger, and many more. Sorry, that was the micro machines guy. I don't know how that got in there. All right. Let's get back to our uh, fan duel ad. <laughs> 1-800-9 with it in Indiana, 1-877-70 stop in Louisiana, 1-877-8 hope NY or text hope NY 467369 in New York, Tennessee Redline 1-800-889-9789 in Tennessee, 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming, or visit 1-800-gambler.net in West Virginia. I don't know if it's an auditory illusion, Stefan, but I feel like he kind of slowed down at the end, like he lost a little bit of steam. Um, I am going to now offer my own disclaimer to that disclaimer, which is that the National Council on Problem Gambling has a 24-hour confidential national helpline at 1-800-522-4700. That number works for calling or texting. According to their website, it provides resources and referrals for all 50 states, Canada, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. So, for instance, you don't have to remember that the Indiana hotline is, for reasons I can't discern, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. That's 1-800-9-WITH-IT. Last year, ESPN's Ryan Hockensmith did a feature on a day in the life of a hotline worker at one of these problem gambling hotlines. Um, Hawkinsmith wrote, and I quote, many states report getting close to 60 to 70% of calls from aggravated FanDuel or DraftKings users who can't log into their accounts or want to know the lottery numbers. We jest, but a huge number of these calls are genuinely very serious. It mentions one that this hotline worker got from someone who hadn't gambled since 2004, but, and I quote again, had seen such a steady stream of Facebook ads for FanDuel and DraftKings that eventually he couldn't resist one of the sizable, quote, no-risk free money offers to sign up. He'd started gambling again and spent his life savings all using his phone. The piece continues by noting that the hotline worker set him up with treatment options, and it says that the problem gambling treatment community doesn't want to ban gambling. The goal is to create a safety net at a rate commensurate with the deluge of ads. So, by my count, the FanDuel ad that we played excerpts from earlier is 29 seconds long, the Zach Lowe part, and the disclaimer that follows is 33 seconds, which seems like it's probably the correct ratio, to be honest, and the disclaimer part is the part that we should all be listening to. That's 1-800-522-4700 nationwide, stuff. What was the Indiana one again? 1-800-9-WITH-IT. Any other states that you'd like to repeat? That's 1-800-9-WITH-IT. I don't know if I can talk that fast. You're just going to have to listen in my normal voice. That, I think those do get sped up. Though I imagine it's a talent to be able to read that quickly. Those tiny cars don't sell themselves, Stefan. They do not. That is our show for today. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. To listen to past shows and subscribe or just reach out, go to slate.com slash hangup and you can email us at hangup at slate.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. For Stefan Fatsis, I'm Josh Levine. Remember Zombo Beatty, and thanks for listening. Now it's time for our bonus segment for Slate Plus members. And as promised, we have Alex Kirshner back with us. Hey, Alex. Josh, Stefan, great to be with you. So you were just in Indianapolis, Split Zone Duo members, patrons, supporters. We're glad to see you there. And, you know, we were talking a little bit before the show. If the NFL Combine did not exist, how would podcast hosts get to meet up with their listeners. It's a major consideration as there's increasing conversation about uh, whether the combine should be killed off. Jeff Legwald of ESPN had a big feature about it. Um, Damora Smith, the NFL Players Association executive director, has likened it to a slave auction, um, which is never a good thing for your event to be likened to. I um, mean, you can understand, given that they you know, stand on stage and get poked and prodded and and measured as uh, white men ooh and ah at a lot of uh, black men for their athletic talents. 
Um, so, you know, Alex, do you feel like there is or will ever be momentum to do something different or is having all of these players in the same place at the same time to be poked and prodded too valuable to the league for them to ever consider doing anything different? I don't know that it's too valuable to the league for them to ever consider doing something different, but I do think that, that the signs that the NFL is seeing it that way and wouldn't want to let it go are mounting. And you can see that in just the last couple of years, they have started to put certain combine workouts. I don't know that they did this this year, but in spots, they have put combine workouts on network television in prime time. Uh, they have sold title sponsorships for this event. They had one this year with a company uh, that I had not heard of called Noble that paid, I think, a lot of money to plaster itself all over the workout gear uh, that these players were wearing. The NFL fa like fancies itself and has successfully become a year-round sport that owns large chunks of the calendar when football is not being played and the combine is its big March thing uh, before the draft being its big April thing. It's much bigger April thing. So I think the NFL uh, would, would fight pretty hard to keep a combine like event, if not the exact combine. I don't think that the combine is necessary from a testing and scouting standpoint. There is plenty of opportunity for these teams to have players out to their own facilities uh, and to do the poking and prodding both physically and uh, interview wise under their own homes and, and just do it in their respective cities. The thing about the combine that I think is irreplaceable and that will, will probably help it persist is that it's a networking thing for everybody who works in this league. And I think they really, really like that. You know, it's a networking thing for the agents and for the players who may be on the margins or are trying to move up. But Demora Smith makes some great points about what the combine actually is. He called it an intrusive employment action. Doesn't exist anywhere else. You waive all your medical rights. You have to go through this embarrassing, um, these embarrassing uh, question sessions and standing in your underwear type stuff and getting measured for body fat and whatnot. Um, and he concluded, and this was from Jeff Legwall's story, as saying that, you know, what's the reason for all this? To decrease your draft value, um, to find flaws in your ability. That was just a teaser of our Slate Plus segment this week. If you want the whole thing, not just this week, but every week, you need to be a member. Sign up at slate.com slash hangup plus. That's slate.com slash hangup plus. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now.